Well, welcome. We'll just get into it, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. So, so tell us a bit about, I guess, what you know, what what's led you to this point? Because obviously, it's only a couple of weeks away now when you're going to try and attempt to run a um, it's a hundred k's for ten, a hundred k's a day for ten days. Is that right? Yeah, that's a thousand right. k's. From, yeah, from Sydney to Melbourne. So before we kind of get into why you're putting yourself through that punishment. <laughs> <laughs> What's um What's the background? What's Alex uh, Cleary's sort of story? Um, yeah, I mean, where do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I grew up in a, in a pretty small town, uh, Mount Isa, in uh, far northwest Queensland. Bit of mm-hmm. a bit of a rough little joint, but it's pretty nice, more or less. Um, and yeah, I think I grew up there for a while. I played a lot of sport. I enjoyed it, and then um, along the road. Um, yeah, just sort of lost my way a fair bit. Mm. Um, just like partying, a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs. I think just like a a pretty pretty typical teenager, but sort of just went a little bit too far majority of the time. So yeah, then yeah. All that sport sort of sort of went away, and I was sort of left with not much going on, not much purpose, not much happening. And then mm. yeah, like if, if there was a few turning points for sure. Like, a, like my sister passed away at one point there and that, that was a pretty big one as well mm. as like a few close calls with death. And then, yeah, more recently I had a mate um, lose a bunch of weight and that really kicked me up a notch more or less from running. Right. As in so so when would you say that you actually, I guess, because, you know, we, what I find with these sort of situations, it's kind of like an intersection in, in your life where – there's that fork in the road where you have to either go and start making things better or playing that card you've been dealt, which is that, you know, you are a legitimate victim and no <laughs> one's going to tell you that you're not. So you can play that card to just destroy your life and no one's really going to be able to tell you that, you know, you're being um, unreasonable or or behaving badly because you can always play those cards. I mean, if it sounds like you've been through some tough times. So I guess, was there some moment that you can put your finger on where you went and like, I want to go north, not south? Uh, I think there were just a bunch of small moments. I think there wasn't right. a, like a direct 180 degrees turn. I think there were a bunch mm. of 10 degrees turns that eventuated to 180 degrees. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what yeah. I think is, is more likely that happened. So there, sure. was, there was a time – um, like I used to party a lot and when I went, I would always go down to Groove in the Moo, which is a, mm-hmm. like a music festival in Townsville. So, you know, I remember two weeks before I left, I took, I bought 30 pills, like MDMA caps. Mm-hmm. And then in the two weeks to get there, I ate them all just partying in Mount Isa, which is like, it's not a great place to party, you know? So like, what are you doing? And I ate them all. And then when I flew there, I was like, well, I got no drugs. I got to buy some more. So I got 30 more pills just for the weekend. Mm -hmm. And then after we partied all weekend and then I had a motorbike that I'd bought that I got shipped down to Townsville and then I was going to ride it back to Mount Isa. So, you know, I partied from, you know, Thursday all the way to Tuesday and then Wednesday morning thought it would be a great idea to ride a motorbike, you know, Mm -hmm. nine hours home. Obviously, I had no sleep. I'd been drinking the night before as well. And then I crashed probably five or six hours into that ride yeah. just outside of Richmond. And then I remember that was a pretty big turning point, mainly because I'd realized how close I was to dying. And at the time, I didn't have any money because not because I didn't have a good paying job or anything like that, just because I'd piss all of it up the wall. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I was an electrician by then. Had a good paying job in the mines. If you had, How old were uh, you when that happened? Oh, that's a great question. I would have been maybe maybe 20, 21, not sure, mm. roughly around that that age. But yeah, just just I remember that day I had maybe a hundred dollars left in my bank account, and that was probably just enough to pay for fuel for the motorbike to get home. Like mm. not enough to get any breakfast, not enough to even get a coffee. I think I was probably scratching pretty tight to get that that hundred dollars to get me all the way home, and then all day I was sort of like dozing and I was tired and I was just riding flat out. I was like that, that was the only way I thought I could get home, and yeah, just 
just done. Came off the road, fell asleep, hit an irrigation, uh, hit a irrigation spot, and then just destroyed the bike. Like destroyed a lot of my body. Thankfully, mm. like no broken bones, which was crazy. And then yeah, I had a mate drive like five hours from Mount Isa to come pick me up. I just woke up in the hospital with him. Like, all right, let's go. Mm. And then I, I just remember that was a definite. The, there was definitely a ten degree uh, change in your attitude that day. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was, and you know, because as we were driving home, you know, he's sort of speeding, not speeding, but like you're doing 110 on the highway there. And I just remember I was tearing up, and I was just like, kind of had PTSD almost from him just driving normally, like not driving recklessly at all. Yeah, and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? And then yeah. it was again. After I came home and I we went to my parents' house because I was dropping off the motorbike there and my mum was just bawling her eyes out and my old man's like, you're a fucking idiot, you mm -hmm. know? And then when I got back to my house and I was sitting on the couch that night, I had to call in sick to work the next day and, you know, I'm all banged up on the couch and I was just like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. That's that was, crazy. That, yeah, well, it was definitely one of them. It was a TT 600 Triumph. I still have it. Oh, yeah. we, we ended up rebuilding it. And when I say we, yeah, I right. mean mostly my old man. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty heartbreaking. Now I'm a father and I think I've got a 14-year-old son and I can only imagine how how heartbreaking and how um, stressful that would be, you know. And yet I look back and I did similar things to my parents. It's almost a rite of passage to make your parents freak out. But I think you uh, definitely took a trophy of some sort that day. That yeah, was um, yeah. that would have been pretty upset and stressed, man. Yeah. yeah was there something that caused, I guess, this – do you look at it and analyze and go, why Why did I walk that path or why did I find myself in that spot? Yeah, no, I've definitely reflected a lot on why I was that way. And Cause I, I've, it's hard to put it down to one single thing. I think there was definitely wanting the attention, wanting the – the adrenaline as well from going out and being the most drunk or the the most fucked up or being able to take the most drugs, you know, there was sort of that almost competitive or almost competitive in that sense. But yeah, just definitely for the attention wild. for sure. It's wild. I talked to another um another I had a podcast with another guy who's also a, a, a um you know, an extreme uh, elite athlete running, you know, um Lane Storia, you probably know him. And if you've listened, to, if you've listened to his podcast, it's the same sort of. I mean, obviously varying degrees of crazy, but um, same sort of notion that it's like there's this weird uh, wanting to be the most, like you know, the, drinking the most or doing the most drugs or being the most loose, um, which is just a strange thing that you know maybe there's a bit of a phenomenon of that occurring at the moment. I don't know, but um, yeah, it's definitely something. I've not. It's not. You're not the first person that said that. Is what I'm saying. You know. Yeah, yeah, I definitely don't think I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so after that, I guess, what then got you to sort of want to start on the health um, avenue? Because you've obviously gone through those changes. Was it was it the mental health and the physical health were the two sort of? Um, was it a, a matter of getting them both sorted? Yeah, I think. I mean, they basically walk hand in hand, in my opinion. You know, I think. Yeah, you, yeah. You can't have a great physical health without also having a reasonably healthy mental health as well. You know. Sure. So yeah, I think um, it was just just sort of realized I was going down the wrong path, and then when I I I was I remember I was sitting. I'd just been paid that day. I was in Mount Isa, and I was working a job that I hated. And I just thought, why the fuck am I doing this? I've wanted to leave Mount Isa for so long and I just booked a one-way flight to Bangkok mm. that day for like six months in advance. And that was probably one of the best things I ever did in my entire life was book that flight because <laughs> as soon as I mm. left Mount Isa then, well, yeah, my life changed a lot when I left there. I just took myself out of that environment because, you know, it's just, it is just a lot of drinking a lot of stuff like that and you sort of you just get stuck in that cycle of well what else am i going to do you know yeah yeah and so what do you do in bangkok when you're um when you've got six months in bangkok what do you do there oh well that was the worst part as i covid started <laughs> oh, right. okay you get stuck there did you uh almost i wanted to stay uh so i did i finished work 
And then I flew over to Bangkok and then within two weeks, COVID kicked off. It was in March mm. 2020. And then I think I caught one of the last flights back to Australia and I thought, well, there's absolutely no way I'm going back to Mount Isa. I quit my job. I sold all my stuff. Yeah. I don't want to go back there. You know, I'm already, I'm already out. So I was deciding between Noosa and Melbourne and uh, unfortunately I chose Melbourne at the time. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I went straight into lockdowns. Straight into lockdowns, yeah. Yeah. To be fair, it was probably one of the best times of my life in all honesty Mm. because as soon as we were locked down, then, you know, I couldn't find a mine that would would get me out of Melbourne. I couldn't find find anyone who would fly me out of Victoria. It was quite a challenge because I've only ever worked in mining, so I'm not going to go try and work in a house or anything like that. I'd be no good. But I just sort of had to sit on my hands for a little while. And then that's when I just had all this money sitting around because I was supposed to be traveling for the next, you know, year or two. Mm. So then I just bought a bunch of camera equipment and just dive, dove as far as I could into that. And mm. I thought, well, if I'm learning all this camera stuff and I'm trying to, I don't know, learn how to be a photographer, I'll also need to do some sort of sport. You know, I've done sport my whole life and with the nature of my work, flying in and out all the time you know I, I, it's really hard to play team sports you know if you're one sure. week here and then one week there and then it just doesn't work out so I thought oh well you know running's not too bad I'll give that a crack mm. and then you know I just hammered routine as hard as I could at that time so I'd wake up go for a run first thing in the morning and then I'd have like a really big breakfast and then I'd sit on the laptop and I'd edit some photos or I'd watch YouTube videos on how to edit or I was just sort of pretty much enamored with anything to do with photography at the time. Yeah, right. And then, yeah, I just I just enjoyed that routine. So like Monday to Friday was just run and then absorb as much as possible out of photography and then the next day mm-hmm. run and then the weekend would just be chill, you know, just relax. Yeah. What were the team sports that you used to play? Oh, everything, man, everything. The ones yeah. I was best at. Uh, was softball was the one I was the best at. But, you mm. know, growing up in Mount Isa, I played everything, you know, AFL, rugby league, rugby union, touch footy, mixed netball, everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, loved- and then so when you when you kind of, I guess, found yourself in this route, this, I guess the FIFO routine is a strange one to fit in with, uh, you know, regular schedules and stuff. So did that, um, did that, I guess, was that something that pissed you off or were you okay with that and then just decided to get get more into the sort of solo pursuits? Yeah, well, I'd never worked fly and fly out until uh, I moved to Melbourne because before that mm. I worked in Mount Isa and lived in Mount so Isa. So you were so there, that's It right. was never an issue. And, you know, all these sports of, you know, Mount Isa takes five minutes to drive from one side to the other. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's a pretty easy place to get around. But, yeah, when I moved to Melbourne and then eventually I got – uh, flown out of Victoria to go work at another mine and then I stayed out of Victoria for a while and it mm. was, you know, I didn't really have anything else to do so I ran a little bit here and there and, yeah, I would much rather play a team sport but, you know, it's just it was just so hard with the lifestyle. So what's this, um, I guess, journey been? If we just look at the running journey, how long have you really been seriously at that now for? Well, I was pretty serious at the start of COVID and then I probably did about eight weeks, got injured and then I didn't really run again for another year. Mm. And then I was sort of slowly running just here and there whenever I sort of felt like it. And then it wasn't until um, pretty early on last year I had a mate, he lost about 35 kilos running Mm -hmm. and I watched him do that. And at that point in time, you know, I'd probably spent a few years developing myself just to be a little bit better. I wasn't as much of a piss wreck. Uh, I definitely didn't do fuck all drugs compared to what I used to. Mm. And after I watched him do that, I sort of thought I'm kind of like journaling. I'm doing like these review, like weekly reviews. I'm doing all these things that I think is going to help me. And they were helping me. They were making me a better person for sure. But I was doing them at such a low output that I might as well have not have been doing them at all. Mm. So, because I I saw him, someone who was, I think he's like 126 kilos and I saw the effort and the action that he took to get himself down to like 90 kilos in, in six months. 
Mm. And I thought, fuck, if he can do that in that amount of time, like what the fuck am I doing? You know, there's mm. I'm putting in such little effort compared to what he's doing and that no wonder I'm not getting very far with what I'm doing. Right. And then once I watched that, that's that's when I really was like, fuck, all right, let's hammer this as hard as I can. Mm. So when you say I'm still a little bit sort of so – just to clarify, I guess what we're talking about was there some? Were you not happy, or were you were you trying to deal with something at that point, or were you, were you just trying to? When you say journaling and stuff, was there something, or you mentioned like trying to make progress on something? What what exactly were you trying to solve or resolve at that point? Was there anything standing out in your life at that point, or just being a better person? I think just being a better person. I was pretty. I really enjoy personal development. I like the idea mm-hmm. of just getting better every day. And, you know, over the course of the last probably five years, that's sort of been my mission is just to get as good as possible at being the best version of myself I can be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, early days that would start with, you know, journaling some sort of gratitude journal or maybe a to-do list or maybe a weekly review, maybe a quarterly review, maybe some yearly goals. And, you know, slowly just doing these things one by one, bringing them onto the the routine, I guess you would say. And then, you know, I'm sort of doing these things and they're, you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to be the best version of myself. But when I see the, the output that he was outputting and then I was looking at my own life, I thought, you know, I'm kind of doing these things that aren't making me a better person. They're helping, you know, gratitude journal was making me a lot more grateful for my surroundings, which sounds yeah. ridiculous, but, you know, I'm sort of doing these things, but because I'm doing them at such a low output, it's almost like you're just treading water where I watched him just fly past me and I thought, fuck, why am I not doing that? Why am I not going as hard as I can at something that I'm, I'm trying to achieve? Is that a, is that a, uh, do you think that's kind of like a realization that you've had, um, like, I guess, you know, cognitions happen in different levels, I guess, but that sounds like a, almost a mantra in a sense that if you want to do something, you've got to invest in it and you've got to really push like the, to get the most out of it. You've really got to give it a proper go. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I think you just, it's, it's definitely something I've learned over the last year. Like I think mm. over the last year, my life is completely different to where it was, you know, at the start of last year. Yeah. And the only thing that's really changed is I've just gone as hard as I can at all the things that I'm trying to chase. So I think, you know, you put yeah. in the effort and you will get the return. Well, I just see it in society. Like I see a lot of dabblers, you know, like a lot of people uh, not really doing anything that, that hard on fitness, let's say, and they don't get anywhere with their fitness. They don't do that hard or anything real sacrifice and make any real sacrifices, you know. Um, and I, I saw a guy on um, that I follow on Instagram say the other day that if you don't sacrifice for the thing that you want, the thing that you want becomes the sacrifice. Oh, that's and I such remember a great thinking, saying. yeah, I thought it was quite. Cool. It's Tom Parnos. He's a, he's a real estate agent, <laughs> anyway. But <laughs> but um, but I just he does he does he, he's also he's a cancer survivor and he does put these quite poignant references on his page sometimes. And I just remember thinking. Um, you know, that life's a bit like that. You know, we all work with people or we know people or we, we are people, I should say. Right. We should, instead, I'm trying to not point the finger at everyone else all the time. It's often, um, you know, y- yourself that's the one that has to do the looking. But, um, you know, I notice a lot of people sort of are just dabbling with stuff. They're not really. You know, if they're, if they're studying, they're not really going right. I'm studying full. I'm, I'm I'm really studying with high intention. Or if they're if they're cycling, they're not. You know, they're doing like an hour a week. You know, around the block type of thing. Whereas, I think that what you're sort of identifying there is that if you really want to do something, you have to make it. You know, something that you you do almost as a professional and really get into it, and then that's when you see the results. You know. Yeah, I think it's just it's hard for people to do that when they they kind of do things not because they completely believe in it but just because maybe that's what everyone else does mm. you know yeah. why did you why did you why did i become an electrician oh because it was the only thing that was available at the time you know <laughs> sure so of yeah, course i'm yeah. not going to go 100 percent to it but at the same time you know if i did imagine where i'd be <laughs> i know yeah well 
I think that's um, yeah, that, that, that's a conversation that goes on forever, isn't it? Because I guess we're also there's that constant battle between trying to be yourself and also being a product of your surroundings. You know, um, what I guess have you noticed now that you're um, I guess trying to expand? This is something that I I find interest an interesting subject is like when you try to develop and when you try to change. How did you go with the people around you, and did you have to I guess lose some friends? Did you have to deal with some criticism? Did it upset some people that you were trying to improve yourself? Yeah, I think, um, I think one, I was really fortunate that I left Mount Isa, so I didn't have any face-to-face criticism. Mm. And I think as well, you know, when I started to do, especially these sort of challenges that I've been doing lately, is, you know, I started a completely new Instagram. I didn't post any of my old stuff, like like my personal Instagram that used to just be photography and, and travel and whatever else. So, you know, I get to avoid a lot of it, but, you know, there's definitely a lot of friends that, you know, aren't around anymore, but they're not, Mm. they're not major losses, you know, because the true friends are still around. They're still with Mm. me. And you'd be so surprised the impact that you have on the people around you that are real. You know, I had, I was down in Ultraman, which is in Noosa. It's like a, uh, an Ironman, like a double Ironman. And one of the guys, one of the guys that was crewing with me, we used to play softball together back in the day. And, you know, he's a little bit of a, a bigger guy. And when we went down there, he was crewing for me. So he was pretty much driving the car, helping us out. Mm. After that, well, during during the event, we all made him, uh, we made him sign up for a 30K mountain bike ride, which was awesome because he hadn't touched his mountain bike in ages. And he's like, yeah, no, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. And he did it. He did it just the other day. He's already bought himself a road bike. He's been cycling uh, on the road now as well. And he just signed up for like a 100K uh, ride for charity. And uh, and yeah, like you'd be so surprised the impact that you can have on the people around you that you wouldn't expect to have an impact on. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Well done. It's great to yeah, – I guess you'll never really know – you know, I guess it works both ways, right? You can influence the world in either – whatever you do, it's going to create an impact, you know? What are yeah, some exactly. of your feats that you've done? What are some of the big um, runs and some big physical challenges that you've done? So you've, you've done the Ultraman? Yeah, Ultraman. So that was a yeah, double-distance Ironman over three so, days. So what is that? It, it, for those who aren't familiar with the sport, just the, the run leg, the swim leg and the um, bike leg, what are they? Yeah, it's a 10K swim and then uh, on day one, it's a 10K swim and then a 145K ride. And then on day two, it's a 275K ride and then day three is 84K run. Wow. But I signed up for that in December and I'd never swum in my life before. And I only <laughs> picked up a bike in the middle of February, but I, I had cycled before that. Yeah. So yeah, that, the real challenge for me was the swim. That was How'd you go with it? We finished it. Yeah, I finished it. I was petrified of the swim, but we got there. It took. Where was that one? That was in Noosa. Yeah. Yeah. What a place to. So that was the Noosa try. Is that the the famous Noosa try that? Uh, it's called Ultraman haven't... Australia. Oh, so it's not the Noosa one. That's a different nah, nah, weekend. Nah, is nah, it? Different right, one. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And I saw you. Um, you you went you went to Antarctica. Yeah. That... Yeah. I did a marathon in Antarctica in well, December. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was awesome. So that's that was not long one... ago. Six months ago. Eight yeah. months ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the – after I watched my mate lose all of his weight, the first thing I did was go on Google and find the hardest marathon in the world. And, yeah, when I was going through Google, I found the Antarctica one. Wow. And I thought, yeah, this looks sick. And that's when I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to do this – well, if I'm considering doing this challenge, like this run this marathon in Antarctica, well – you know, I, I might as well try and raise as much fucking money as possible. So that, then we linked up with Black Dog Institute. And yeah, that was pretty much the next, I don't know, what was it? Maybe eight months of my life was pretty much just running. That's when I, mm. I fully committed to running. That's when I started doing a lot of challenges in the lead up to that. So I think we did like a marathon a day for seven days. Um, I did my first 100K run from Geelong to Melbourne. Um, what else did we do? That's all this year, hey? No, that was all last year. Yeah. Oh, was that before the Antarctica one? Yeah, that was in the lead up. Yep. Yep. Right, and that okay. was while I was working in um while I was working in Africa. So it's pretty hectic little schedule going on. Wow. Was that in the mines in Africa? 
Yeah, yeah, I was working in Mali in West Africa. Wow. Yeah, I saw some of your footage on Instagram, like of you, just the, you know, you said you're a, you're a creature of routine and, you know, just the way you had to eat the same thing every day and, <laughs> and you know, you're training and then swimming in the pool and yeah, it was wild. But the thing I got out of that is that real, really there's that, you really have that no excuses attitude. Just make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you can make things happen. You just have to give it a crack. Like mm. when I, well, I was working in Africa, that's when I signed up for Ultraman. But, you know, I didn't have any access to a pool. So the pool that you saw me swimming in was not a pool. That was a, a storage water for the underground mine. So that wasn't clean water. It's full of fucking shit. It's actually pretty disgusting. Wow. And I couldn't, I couldn't swim in that during the day because it's on a mine site. So I would mm. swim in that in my lunch break on night shift. So I'd have 40 minutes every night whenever I was on night shift. So it's just, you know. Dedication, man. Yeah. I kind of feel like people have the origin story of how they get to where they are. And it's like the harder it is, the better the story is going to be. You yeah, know, and that's, yeah, that's yeah. all that was playing through my mind when I was spitting out whatever disgusting filth was in there out of my mouth while I was trying to swim. That's awesome. We'll have to put some footage of that up. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Water is murky as fuck. It's dark. I can't see fuck all while I'm swimming. I tied some ropes up so I had some lanes so I stopped swimming into the walls. It's not even a real swimming pool. If there's one thing I've learned over the last eight months of just pushing my body to the limit, it's that if you really want something, you will make it work. When I signed up for the Ultraman in May, I had never swum freestyle in my life. Not effectively, anyway. So when I looked around here in Africa, I thought, all right, where the fuck am I gonna swim? There's absolutely no way that I can get to this Ultraman having not swum for six weeks at a time. There is no chance I would make the 10 kilometer swim. This is the water that feeds the underground mine that I work in. Can't tell anybody at work that I swim in it because I'm definitely not allowed to. So I have to swim at night shift in my lunch break so nobody catches me. Do I have the most ideal swimming condition? Fuck no, but it doesn't matter because I'm making them work to the way that I need them. You might not be able to change your environment, but you can change your attitude to the environment and work with what you got. So if you really want something, you will make it work. And so moving forward then, I guess, where did you hatch this idea to, so to run from Sydney to Melbourne? Are you going along the Hume? No, nah, no, nah, we're going to go along the A1, along the coast. Along the coast, yeah. Yeah, Sydney to Melbourne is sort of the secondary goal. The main goal is to get 100Ks a day for 10 days. That's what really excites me. Yep. So because yeah, so, it's a bit longer than that, isn't it, along the coast? The A1's a bit longer than that. It's probably 1,200K. Yeah, well, the A1 is probably just – it's the map that I've got so far is 1,030Ks. Oh, but okay. But if you go along the Hume, it's like 790Ks or, or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, I've ridden Melbourne to Sydney before. Oh, that's wicked. Yeah, 14 days. That wasn't a real challenge as such, but it was, um, it was, I mean, it was a challenge for me and it was a challenge, but it wasn't anything that, you know, the average decent fitness level couldn't have done because we staggered it out, you know, so it was doable. And um, it was really, it was a great time in my life. It was 20 years ago now, but I rode from Melbourne post office to Sydney post office along the A1, yeah. Yeah. But there's some serious uh, mountains in there as well. <laughs> so um, I don't wait. know how you're going to go go over going over those. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how we go. We'll see how we go. And you say like it's it's not much for the average person, but you know the the difference between actually doing it and what someone can do is is completely different, you know. Correct. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people could run from Sydney to Melbourne a lot faster than me, but it's whether mm. or not you actually do it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's a great great um note, man. Um, so tell us about what, how, how did you get, how did you hatch that plan? What was the thinking behind that? And what, well, I guess you had done seven marathons in seven days. Or were you just trying to sort of up the ante? Yeah, well, uh, to be honest, I think it was last August. I watched um, Chris Turnbull run across Australia and break the, uh, break the record in 39 mm -hmm. days. And he was running, uh, I think it was roughly 100Ks a day for 40 days. And mm. at the time, at that time, that's when I was doing the seven marathons in seven days. And I was just blown away that somebody could do 40 days straight of 100Ks a day when I was struggling to do 42Ks a day for seven days. I thought, that's fucking insane. 
Wow. So, I mean, I got a lot of inspiration from him. There's no doubt. I mean, I, I followed pretty closely along with his journey there. I just thought it was so cool, especially because he's just an engineer that likes to run. You know what I mean? He's mm -hmm. got a wife, two kids, I think. And he's just a regular guy. He's, he's not some crazy athlete. He's just a guy who just said, fuck it, I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's remember, amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember him talking about um, previously running from Sydney to Melbourne and I thought, fuck, that sounds awesome. And mm. I got pretty excited about running from one place to another and not long after that, that's when I did the um, – oh, it was just before that actually. I did the Geelong to Melbourne. Mm. I just thought it just sounds so cool. I'm running from one town to another. It just seems ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I so just thought – once you had that sort of locked in, did you realize that there was an opportunity to do something as well socially, like uh, with the Black Dog Institute? Yeah, well, I've kind of thought, you know, after doing after doing the Antarctica Marathon, um, it sort of it sort of dawned on me how hard it is to fundraise and how much it takes out of you. It's mm. quite it's quite a big effort to fundraise, and it's honestly it's not that fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, not it's not that fun at all. So, mm. uh, you know, I wanted to fundraise as much as possible, but for my own mental health, I'm like, I can't just do it for every single challenge. Yeah, so I yeah. thought, you know, one a year is probably a fair proposition. So after doing the Antarctica one, I thought, all right, I need a rest like this. Just asking people for money sucks. Mm. And I thought Ultraman would be a nice one to just focus on because honestly, I was shit scared of the water. So I thought maybe the Sydney to Melbourne would be a good one to uh, a good one to fundraise for and then, you know, whatever I do next year, then that'll be the, the next one. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And what, what's your, I guess, thoughts about the Black Dog Institute and, and why that charity? Well, I think when it comes to charities, the ones that, the ones that I care most about are the ones focused on mental health and suicide prevention, which obviously Black Dog ticks off. And that's because, uh, like, I lost my sister uh, when she was 28 to suicide. Mm. And that's had obviously such a profound effect on me. I was only 19 at the time and I'd never had anyone die close to me at all. So I'd, I'd never lost a grandparent, nothing. I was never mm. alive to lose a grandparent anyway, I should say. Yeah. So, yeah, it had, a, it had a pretty profound effect on me. And, you know, when I was looking at the different charities, I thought I'd heard that... It takes 25 years for scientific evidence to become um, like common knowledge. And I thought that just seems pretty ridiculous that mm. if we learn something about techniques that will help or any type of information that will help, like scientific information that will help us be better with our mind or be able to prevent more suicides and we're going to wait 25 years until that is... Mm common knowledge i don't know it just seems ridiculous to me so i kind of feel like black dog institute are heavily tied in and i think they're the only people in australia maybe even the southern hemisphere i'm not quite sure that actually research and do scientific studies towards um mental health and suicide prevention mm -hmm. and i feel like well if it's going to be 25 years until that's going to come into common knowledge then fuck just give all the money to the people who are researching it mm -hmm. And so, because that, that's actually, it's a Melbourne-based, uh, isn't that started out of Melbourne? I think they're Sydney. Oh, are they? Okay, yeah. I I think they not, they might sure. be Melbourne, but I'm pretty sure they've got a head office in Sydney. Mm. I'm pretty sure. And so, I guess, um, having exposed yourself to this subject and obviously with, you know, the tragic story of your sister, what's your, I guess, what could you share with us about that subject? Like, is there something that you see that, um, is good advice in this area or is there any like anything you see going on in the world at the moment or have you got some sort of perspective? Towards having- Towards a suicide and towards like, I guess, because obviously I know we're, we're from from anecdotal evidence that, um, you know, the the rates amongst men anyway are increasing and generally speaking, I guess there's- um, mental health is a, is a massive issue. What's your sort of observations on that? Yeah, geez. I mean, there's so many, 
There's so many. You know, I think for men. I'm not trying particular- to put you on a spot or anything. It's more <laughs> just like I thought you might have some, you know, I guess ha- have some observations and some insight that could help or, or that, you know, that other people haven't really thought about. Yeah, I don't know if other people hadn't really thought about it. I think, you know, majority of the things that will help are, uh, I want to say common knowledge, you know what I mean? Mm. Like have a good group of friends, be in a reasonably stable job, you know, have a decent mm. income, you know, things that obviously aren't easy to do just straight out the gate. But I think, you know, at least in my sister's case, she was isolated from people that knew her. She had uh, addiction problems. Um, she suffered pretty heavily from um, depression and anxiety. Mm. And she really didn't have the right people around her. And she didn't have people that knew how to help her either. Mm. So, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of things that can go on there, but I just think if you have the right people around you, it's really hard to fall into those traps. But also, I don't suffer with severe depression and anxiety, so it's hard for me to say what could really help the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, it's a it's an awful um, an awful scene. I think um, have with what we touched on earlier with social media. Do you think um, that's also exacerbating the issue, or do you think that 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 people get too fixated on those things? Oh, no doubt, no doubt. I mean, mm. you see the best looking people on Instagram. You see, you know, I might run hundred k's a day for ten days. But, you know, there's another guy running the length of Africa, you know. It's like yeah. you're never going to be the best, you know. Comparison and I think, you know, is the thief of joy, as they say. Exactly, exactly. And mm. I think people people sometimes say to me like, oh, fuck, I could never do that. That's so crazy. And I think, man, you definitely can, you know. Yeah. You shouldn't, you shouldn't look at people on Instagram and think of them as real people. You should just look at them and think of them as... <laughs> fucking puppets in some fairyland because most of the time it's all bullshit anyway and it's, it's hard yeah, to find yeah. a real person online anyway yeah that's true how have you gone with your um what have you learned with doing your podcast and how have you found that what have you got out of that oh a lot of really really good conversations i really can't complain like it's it's great it's it's been such a joyous time you know the main bedroom of my house is a podcast studio <laughs> you know, it took a while to build it, but we got there. We got the cameras, yeah. we got the lights, we got the soundproof. It's awesome. I love it. Yeah, but, well, great. You know, just being able to sit down with someone that A, interests me and B, I'm probably just like infatuated with, you know, just some cool people and just being able to chew their ear for, you know, an hour or two. I mean, mm. if you could do it without the cameras and the mics, I mean, it would be awesome regardless, you know just to sit down with anybody and have a good conversation for, you know, an hour or two. I mean, there's, there's no negatives that can come from that. That's right. That's you right. Just, yeah. You learn so much about people. Like, well, why do you do it? Yeah. Same sort of reasons, I guess. I think, um, my, my initial reason was just to, um, exactly like you said, just have a good conversation and, and talk to interesting people. But as I've done more of it, I've realized that I'm actually also um, in, in, uh, capturing my thoughts at the time and capturing me in a way as well and capturing my opinions. And, and now that I've got three kids, I also <laughs> part of me thinks that, you know, it's nice for them to one day be able to hear my opinions on subjects and how I felt about things that I might never get. So there's a selfish part of me actually likes putting my thoughts down, I think, in a, in a way that maybe journaling or diaries may never actually capture, you know what I mean? Um, and also maybe I'll look back as well and think of the things that I thought and reflect on them and think maybe I think differently or I've grown since then or so there is a little selfish part of me that, that enjoys doing it. Um, but ultimately being able to pin someone down and, and, not, and, and work things through is, is probably one of the biggest problems we have in society. It, it, as soon as the going gets tough in any conversation these days, I think people just bail. And um, I see it a lot in um, my friends who are dating. You know, um, no one ever – it's just there's this whole thing about ghosting people or just, you know, it's just – once, once people just decide they don't want to talk to you, they just they leave so many things unresolved. And I think when you're walking through life, leaving unresolved things behind you, even if it's just conversations, I don't think it's a healthy way 
to live. So I think the opportunity to sit with someone, have them pinned down, get get the, the beginning, the middle and the end of the conversation out of the way and um, work through a sort of a subject is is satisfying, you know. And I hope the listeners kind of feel that as well that, you know, they go on a bit of a journey and get to the end of it and go, yeah, you know, I got something out of that, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect because, I mean, anyone who listens to your podcast is probably similar to you in that regard. So, I mean, if you enjoy the conversation, then they're probably going to enjoy the conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, yeah, especially the other thing I've learned to do is just not worry about the listener as much, you know. I think if you're doing something like for yourself, um, that's probably a good way to do it. If you're enjoying it and you like your product and you're improving the product, the, the rest of it will either take care of itself or it won't. I don't think I'm fixated on that side of it as well, which is good because I've got, you know, other things to take up my attention. But, yeah. Um, do you have plans for, I guess, any, any um, w- with the podcast side of things, is it something that you want to ha- – that you have – do you write down – when you're saying you do your goals, do you write down goals on that side of it as well and what you want to achieve with regards to that? or with this whole, I guess, pers- persona of the, the fitness person? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, the I have goals for everything and the podcast definitely has goals. At the moment, the goal is to just con- continue to be consistent. You know, it's bi-weekly at the moment and then that's 14 reels over two weeks plus the actual editing of the, the podcast. You know, at the moment, consistency is the, the biggest thing and then mm. it's going to be slowly improving and then I think – Come the end of the year, if I can continue continue to be consistent, and we got the ball rolling well, then yeah, there'll be some big goals for next year. But for now, it's it's mainly just consistency more than anything. Mm. And what about with your running and the 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 hundred k's? <coughs> Obviously, you don't want to look too far beyond that right now. But what's the actual? Is this an? Have you got a target of doing something for fundraising every year? Um. Well, is that like what you said before or is that? Yeah, yeah. I think I'll fundraise for something every year. There's there's one, like I want to cross the country and I want to break the world record. That's that's my ultimate goal at the moment. And in all honesty, running from Sydney to Melbourne is really just prep for that. Mm. You know, if I can do this well and we get some good sponsors on board and we get used to negotiating and we get used to sending emails and we get used to podcasts and we get used to all that sort of thing and I can do the run and I think yeah we, we're going to take a lot of lessons from this mm. and it goes well then I think yeah why not why not try and break the record while crossing the country you know I took a lot of inspiration from Chris Turnbull and I thought fuck me like if he can do it why can't I yeah you know so, so you got I, a, he's, he's got a target on his back is that what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> he does he does have a target on his back but i'm you know i bet he'd be wrapped to inspire you man he'd be that kind of guy he'd be so he happy actually, to hear someone else wants to try and do it he is he's said as much yeah and what about um your training and nutrition like what's the what what's that like at the moment what's your training program yeah well it's pretty much either running or in the gym every day apart from Monday, which is today. So it's a Monday's my only rest day. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, we're just slowly building at the moment. I had a knee injury a few weeks ago, which uh, was not the way I wanted to start the block, but that's okay. It only dropped about two and a half weeks and then we got back on the horse. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't all bad and everything's going good now. So how many Ks are... A week or I guess are you are you blocking – what's your block in that sense? Is it like a weekly amount of kilometres? Yeah, it's mainly just the long runs that we're considering, like that we're worried about. So I think I just did uh, 40 and 20 on the weekend. And this weekend will be 60 and 60 and 40. And then the next weekend will be 80 and 50, maybe 80 mm. and 60. And then that's as much as I can go because then I'll have a two-week taper – and then it'll just be ready for the big dance. But I think, you know, I don't think the kilometers matter as much. Mm. I think the time on the feet matters a fair bit and also just the preparation of being up every morning, running, exercising, whatever it is, I think that is more important than any amount of Ks getting put on the legs. 
Mm. I think just being able to show up for every single session and fit all this other stuff in, I think mentally that's going to prepare me more than anything. Yeah, wow. How is it going, fitting it in around the rest of your life? Yeah, is honestly, it- the everything in my life right now is f- fucking hectic. Yeah. It's hectic, you know. It's um, it's a lot of really early mornings. You know, I work from 5 to 1 every day, mm-hmm. at, you know, as an electrician. So then, you know, what's tomorrow? Tuesday. So that means I'll probably be running straight after work because uh, it's a tempo session. And then after that, what's tomorrow? Tuesday. Tuesday, I'll have to film and edit for Instagram. And then that pretty much takes up the rest of the day. Bed, then, you know, Jesus. Wednesday... Wednesday, I think I have 50 minutes, so I have to do that before work. So that's, you know, waking up quarter to three, running for 50 minutes, then getting ready is to go to work. Is there a sense of, although it seems hectic, is there a sense of sanity that comes with having every minute of your day accounted for? Uh, I like it. I mean, it's it's the way I would prefer to live. Yeah. Like I, I enjoy I enjoy knowing what I have to do every day. I like routine. I like a schedule. Mm. And it, like I would like more spare time for sure. You know, I'm teetering on the edge of everything falling apart because I just don't have any time left. So, you know, it's it's yeah. it's hard to wrap it all together. And without the help of people like, you know, Taylor Lumley and some other mm. key people like, fuck, there's no way stuff like this could happen because I just don't have enough hands. Sure, sure. And so but on that, who's helping you with the actual – is Taylor helping you with the logistics of the run itself? And because are you going from from Sydney? You're leaving from Sydney, yeah. And so running south, um, what's your actual departure point? Uh, Bondi Beach, Bondi to St right. Kilda is the plan. Right. Okay. So yeah, Taylor's really helped out with outreach, um, talking to different companies, emailing. She's honestly a bit of a fucking wizard when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, mostly everything else. I've had to do by myself, but then I've got um, like Ethan Fleming is going to come and crew me. I've got a videographer coming with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I literally just had a crew member pull out today, so I'm, I'm currently looking for another one. So and we'll see that, how that what goes. That, what does that person need to do, drive? Uh, or- well, it'll be a mixture of driving, maybe a little bit of running, but also it's mainly just the pit stops, making sure I have water, making sure I have food, yep, yelling yep, at yep. me if they need to yell at me. And what will be your day-to-day – like time on the road running. Like yeah, what time do you leave one. in the morning? Oh yeah. I mean, in my opinion, I think like a five AM start would be the best. Or even mm-hmm. earlier, like I don't mind earlier, but I think for everybody else's sanity, like five AM is probably the best time to start. Yep. And if we can knock everything off, you know, run the hundred Ks in, you know, thirteen or so hours for the whole day, including the breaks, then I think that would be pretty good. But at the same time, you know, who knows? Who knows how the legs will feel? Who knows yeah, how fast yeah. I'll be able to run? Who knows? Who knows? It's it'll be yeah. It's a big unknown. It's great. Is it is it going to be something like if you got the downtime? Do you have to use ice baths and things like that at the end of the day to try and get those muscles to contract or recover? Or it, what's the sort of the magic in the middle? Just yeah, sleep? I think. I think sleep is by far the biggest, the biggest one and the most important. But apart from that, I think just uh, getting on the foam roller every night is a big one. It's the thing that I have to do most now is to try and loosen up my legs as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, because before this, I'd never stretched. I'd never done any sort of recovery. I'd never really taken any warm up seriously. Mm-hmm. And because of that, it means my legs are super sensitive um, and very tight. So the... The program we've been running um, with the physio has just been trying to loosen everything up as much as possible and regain as much flexibility uh, as much flexibility as possible as well. So that that'll probably be the same on the run. It's just foam roll as much as possible and stretching. Have you noticed with the stretching that you've seen like your ability to stretch um, improve? Because I'm, I'm a bit the same with running that you know. I'm very inflexible and it's caused a lot of problems over the years, back problems and quad, um, hamstrings and whatnot. And what have, what's your wins or, or takeaways from stretching? Because it is one of those underrated sort of things generally. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to say like I, don't, I can't say that I've noticed an improvement in my running per se, 
but I've definitely noticed an improvement in my flexibility, no doubt. Mm -hmm. And I think the more flexible I am, there's no way that could have a negative impact on my running. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it would probably translate to less injuries and less stress on the body, on the body in general, I guess. Um, yeah, and sure. what about nutrition, man? Like, so what are you actually eating? Because I saw you smashing a snake when we first got on this call. <laughs> Is it nice to be able to eat whatever you want, <laughs> basically, while you're burning this many calories? Yeah, yeah. I do eat flat out pretty much all the time. I eat shitloads mm-hmm. of fruit and I eat, like I have this meal prep is just like pulled chicken and rice and vegetables. And I eat that every day for lunch and dinner every day. <laughs> So you're not, not a foodie per se. Oh, I would love to eat more food, but I just, I simply do not have the time to cook every night. So sure. I just make a massive meal prep on Sunday and then just eat that throughout the week. Do you have any, uh, I guess, like takeaways on just the modern diet? Is, is, it, is it, I know there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, talk about, you know, different types of diet, carnivore diet, keto diet, v- a vegan diet. Like, do you have any sort of like... Have you noticed um, anything on the, in that space or is it something that because you're burning so many calories and you're a pretty bit of an omnivore, you can just get through it and eat anything? Do you find that, that nutrition is something you've, I guess, expanded your mind on? Yeah, definitely. Nutrition is massive. I think without running, I probably wouldn't have been so involved with nutrition for sure. And I'm definitely no genius, but, you know, to me, all those diets – you see people raving about this one or that one and I've had this benefit and this benefit but I think majority of the time what you're seeing is people that are just not eating ultra processed food and Mm -hmm. I mean I don't think it takes a genius to see that all this plastic and shit that's in this food is just no good for you you're getting all these crazy calories everyone's gaining weight like it I I don't think I don't think it's very good for you at all I, I just think any diet you do if you can just eat mostly whole foods you'll be okay in my opinion, yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. Yeah, I don't think you need to stress about things, but I think if you can eat mostly good food, then you'll be fine. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a good takeaway. I think you know if you ever go into a Seven Eleven or a supermarket, even and you just you see rows and rows of food, and it's just not quite food, is it? Right? Yeah, it's just shit. I mean, if something mm. has to tell you that it's healthy, then it most likely it's not healthy. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and you know so I mean? with um yeah i totally mate to- was I, I, I grew up overweight and um so i was one of those you know and i don't blame my parents i mean they were just they were the average mum and dad shopping and listening to the ads and trying to get the the pantry full of things that said high in fiber or you know high in energy or high in this or high in that and unfortunately it took away some of the best years of my life because um i was you know I was a chubby kid like I was and I didn't enjoy it at all and um and unfortunately then a bit like the uh, mental mental health um situation is then when you try to get help the help that you get is not necessarily by any people who even know what they're talking about as well so the advice you get is is garbage you know and so you start thinking that eggs are full of cholesterol so you better not eat (laughs) them or you start thinking that butter's bad for you or all these you know these um, old wives tales about food that you know took me probably till I was 20 years old to really get my head around it and um and fortunately then start you know um getting my body back but um yeah I went through a phase of probably from 13 to 17 years old of being quite self-conscious and um, awkward, you know, as a result of that. So, yeah, it's hard because most of that information is coming from the companies that are making the food. <laughs> you know mm. what I mean? Like, oh, it's just it's just a cycle. Yeah, well, you know, the food pyramid. It's uh, <laughs> bought and paid for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, all right. Well, that's good. Um, and what about fundraising? So, tell us about the the fundraising and what you're trying to achieve. I mean, I know it's a massive target. Um, what's your, um, your, your thoughts on the fundraising for this thing? Yeah, well, we're trying to get a hundred thousand dollars, um, which you're right, is a fucking huge target, but the, the real goal in my opinion, and I have to thank my mom for this cause she's, she's totally right. But you know, a hundred thousand dollars seems like a lot, but 10,000, $10 donations doesn't seem like such a crazy feat. Mm. You know, I think I've 26,000 followers on Instagram if 10,000 of those people just threw in 10 bucks, that's, that's two cups of coffee 
Mm. I don't think there's that many people that can't afford two cups of coffee for something that they believe in. So then mm. the only the only thing is, you know, if, if you believe in this, if you believe in the content that I make or the message that I'm trying to spread, then I think ten dollars is a is a fair a fair amount to throw in because it's not gonna change your life. But, you know, if ten thousand people could change a lot of people's life with, with that kind of money. Mm. And I saw you had the um the hats, the Legionnaire hats, <laughs> which are awesome. Yeah, the Legionnaires are sick. Yeah, so what what prompted that as the the merch of choice? The merch of choice. I got one here actually. Let me. Yeah, let's have a look at it. Well, there it is. <laughs> Smile, it's free. Yeah, yeah, it's wicked. Yeah, so it's when epic um, kit. yeah, I love I love the Legionnaires. The Legionnaires are the best. They're they're a cap, but they're a mullet. You know, they're fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the um. The Legionnaires we made, I made a Legionnaire last year when we did the Antarctica run. Um, right. And the reason I, I just wanted it to be something different, you know, everyone makes a hat or a shirt or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love Legionnaires. Legionnaires and a pair of budgies, that is Australian. That is that's Australia for me. Well, now that it's is... breakdancing, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's done, bro. That's done. <laughs> yeah, to me, a Legionnaire is just iconic iconic mm, so mm. and the smile it's free actually comes from there's this guy in, that uh is in Mount Isa his name's Phil McKay or Phil mm. McKay I might be saying that wrong M-A-K-K-A-I anyway when I started playing rugby league Phil was the guy who would take the money um like the entry fee and right. Phil I found out uh, only recently that he was in a car accident and he uh he's yeah, it lives a very different life. He sort of struggles to get around, but he always wore this hat that said, smile, it's free. And I remember when I would play rugby league when I was like, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, whatever it was, I remember seeing this hat and I just thought, fuck, man, like this guy's got every reason to to just be bitter with the world. Mm. And he's just this beacon of happiness and and uh, he just everyone would be lit up when they when they saw him, and he'd be smiling. He'd give you his money. You'd keep going, and I'd never forgotten that. So then last year I was like, oh man, I would love to put that on a hat. I think it'd just yeah. be so awesome. Have you told and Phil then, that story? Yeah. So I called um I called up Phil's mum, uh, Lynn, a few weeks ago, uh, and that's when I learned more about Phil. I didn't actually know a lot about him. I just said hello to him every week. <laughs> wow. But yeah, I called her up and I, I'm going to send them uh, one of these new hats that when they get made, send them down to Phil and hopefully hopefully he loves it. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, he would have been flattered. Like you were just saying, you never know what the influence you're creating in this world is, you know what I mean? And yeah. who you're affecting and so it's better to be just be, be positive. But that's, that's pretty cool, hey? Yeah, yeah, he's an awesome dude. I imagine he must have had an impact on so many people in that town. Mm -hmm. Do you get back to Mount Isa? Oh, not very often. It's an expensive flight from Brisbane to Melbourne. I think it's yeah. easily eight hundred bucks return. Wow! Yeah, yeah. Mining yeah, it's towns, kind of a man. speck in the middle of nowhere. I've been through it a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Most people like that. I was um, planning to go back in October. I don't think that's going to happen now. But I think um, my partner and I will probably go back for the rodeo next year in August. Oh, yeah, cool. And so, what um, what can people do to to where? How do we get to? Um, contribute to this is there is it the website or is it your insta what's the best way to get get onto you yeah well i mean um at clearly runs is where you'll find everything that i do pretty much and yeah i mean the legionnaire waitlist will be gone by the time this podcast comes out i imagine um right. but yeah how much donation, are they uh i think they're 85 dollars, and then all the money's going to charity so no one's that's making great. any money out of them oh that's awesome which is nice yeah yeah so um yeah, otherwise, yeah, the donation link is in, in my bio. Um, I say it in just about every video at the moment. So it would be hard to not know how to donate. Otherwise, um, <laughs> I think I've got a link uh, for a poster as well if you want to put a poster up at your school or work or whatever. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of ways. Even just sharing anything, it's, it goes a long way. I, I think, look, having done fundraising before myself is like I find that you've literally just got to go one by one. You know, like I, I've, I very rarely find that um, that people, it's it's direct sales, you know what I mean? That's kind of how I look at it. It's like 
Alex, I need you today, right now, to, you know, donate 10 bucks to this. And then next person, I need you. Okay, done? <laughs> Good. Next person, I need you. Because I, I find that just the, the, um, the broad approach just seems – everyone seems to just ignore, you know. I don't know. that, that more, I'm not sure how it goes from where you're sitting, but I find that, you know, people are just, you know, very hard to engage, you know. But once you've actually got them in, in their sights and they actually acknowledge and understand that, yes, they want to do it, then just getting them to do it, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely difficult. Last time – we did uh i was running uh, pretty big kilometers so i would do uh you know if you want to throw in a dollar per k for the week that's what mm. we were doing uh last year we ended up raising twenty eight thousand dollars which was nice that's amazing man <laughs> yeah They're big yeah, numbers was, yeah yeah no that was really it was yeah i was pretty proud of that to be honest yeah that's great that's great and look i think that um you know i, I also if you just look at it from a karma point of view like you know i think that you just you're putting out such good energy and doing such selfless acts that you can't help but you know some good things to come your way out of this i'm sure that there'll be people out there that will just pick up on it and i'm sure that some you know good things are coming man i don't know exactly what but <laughs> you can't do all this po positive stuff and ch turn your life around and um run 100 k's a day <laughs> and not <clears throat> you know get smiled upon by the gods i'm sure something will happen yeah well we're definitely gonna just keep working until that day comes and then keep working after that <laughs> awesome man awesome well i think it's um it's it's been a great chat mate I, i've i've pretty much finished with what i wanted to go through um and i just really wish you all the best i think you're going to do so well and whole I'll make sure we all follow along on the Instagram and there'll be daily updates, no doubt. And it'll be cool. It'll be cool. I hope it, I'll definitely put all the links in the description and we'll share it and make sure that we get as many people as we can to throw some dollars your way. Yeah, of course, man. I really appreciate you having me on. It means a lot. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. All right. Well, we'll speak soon. Sweet. Thanks, mate. Have a good day.